We're so glad that you're joining us. We're here for our third of three webinars about building networks between advocacy and reproductive health partners. Uh, my name is Rose Hennessy. I'm here with the Wisconsin Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And uh, my co-presenter, she's going to wave over the screen. <laughs> Michelle uh, Watkins is with us for healthcare education and training. Um, so I just wanted to come on, say hello. I know a few folks are still joining, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna jump right in. So I'll turn this off. People can see your screen. That's great. If you have any tech questions, you can always put it in the chat. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle, and she'll talk a little bit about what's coming up next. Great. Thanks, Ruth. Um, the two things that I wanted to mention, so um, as part of this uh, project, we have um, three webinars. This is the third of three. And then two other things on the near-term horizon this year. One is the Building Networks Conference. I'm sure you've seen information about this. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to be held June 5th and 6th at the Crown Plaza Hotel in Madison. It is free, and there are travel scholarships available for those of you who are able to come as teams. We're really hoping to encourage folks to come um, as cross-disciplinary teams, folks from the advocacy world, folks from family planning, coming together. Um, so we're able to support that a little bit to help make that happen. Um, registration is now open for that event, and if you haven't seen the email, the open registration um, that should have come out to a last night, and then the advocacy um, this morning. If you haven't seen that, um, you can contact one of us, and, and we can send that to you. Um, and then the next item is sort of related. Can you forward the slide? Uh, so this is for the um, RFP. Uh, this is the request for proposals. Um, for um, pilot projects, we'd like to support um, pilot projects in developing models for collaboration um, in communities that we can then use to um, use those tools in other communities that are trying to do the same thing. So the request for proposals went out in the same email as the uh, conference information, and the, uh, the application and all the information are part of the um, there is also just you know, a technical assistance session. We're holding four applicants in the RFP. It will happen immediately after the um, conference session um, and on the second day. So on Friday, uh, and coaching sessions at noon, and then if you would like to stick around from noon to 1.30, we'll have technical assistance. And those proposals are to, to July 7th, so we hope you'll consider what what creative ideas you might bring to this and submit your applications for that. And that's all I have. <laughs> Great. Um, I know a bunch of you have already been doing the tech stuff with us, um, but just to jump through real quickly, you should see a purple box jump up on your screen. It's on the bottom right-hand corner of the little box that you have right there. And uh, if you can go ahead and just say hello, write your name, um, and Peter, if you can let me know if folks are writing in the chat, just to make sure everyone sees where that is. Um, unfortunately, our system doesn't allow you to see other folks' responses, but um, this is where you can also put in if you lose sound or you've got any general questions that you want uh, us to answer. Peter, do you see stuff coming in? Nope. So again, if you can go ahead into that bottom right chat and put something in, I'll do it right now. Hello. Anything now? Okay, awesome. So it looks like we're good. Thanks for being with us on that. And then second of all, you'll see a yellow box pop up on your screen, and it should be um, a hand symbol. It might be a little bit higher. If you see that, and you can go ahead and raise your hand, practice doing that right now. And Peter, if you can report to me that hands are raised. That's what you can do if you want to be unmuted and you'd like to share at some point, which we love it when folks do that. All right, awesome. So that being said, um, you already got to see Michelle wave. You've heard from me. We're going to have two other folks coming on later in the, the presentation, um, Jan and Alma. So we're very excited to have their perspective. Um, but as we get started, this, this uh, third webinar is on assessment and referral. And when we were preparing for this collaborative, one of the things we did is we um, did some groundwork 
work by just talking with service providers, both through sexual assault and through reproductive health, asking, you know, what are you currently doing? What do things currently look like? And one of the stories that I heard um, from someone, she gave me permission to share, and so I want to do that with all of you today. Um, this was a, a woman who works at a sexual assault um, service agency, and she went in with her daughter to... Um, her daughter had like some kind of a health clinic or appointment. And while she was there, she said her daughter, one of the questions they asked was, do you feel safe in the home? And their initial thought was, wow, that's, you know, that's really awesome that we're asking that. But it's also really interesting that as her mother, she's sitting right here in the room with me and that's being asked. And um, so her daughter kind of looked at her and giggled and said no. So the, the session goes on, and um, this woman, who's a service provider, asked the, the assessor, who was not the doctor at the point, it was some kind of like preliminary health professional, you know, what would you have done if my daughter said no? And she's like, I don't know. No one has ever said no before. She's like, no one has ever said no, that they don't feel safe in their home? And uh, she, she looked kind of panicked. She's like, I really don't know what I would do. Like, that's never happened before. So the physician comes in, and um, she said, hey, you know, I know there was a screening question for my daughter about feeling safe in the home. What would you have done if she said no? And the response, again, was, well, no one's ever said no. <laughs> we don't know what we would do. And um, I think it's a really great example of what groundwork might be needed because putting a question on an intake form doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing a great job of screening and assessing in, in any place, in any way. Um, but it's also a really, really great start. So things that we might have told that environment that can be you know, translated to our agencies, to reproductive health agencies, is that we need to make sure that we have a safe environment for assessment and disclosure. Um, we really recommend having some kind of a policy um, through an agency so people know exactly what they're asking, when they're asking, how they're asking, if they're doing it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and, you know, especially for folks who might be asking about child sexual abuse, what reporting um, might be necessary. We recommend having a private place to conduct those interviews. Again, asking that person's daughter in front of her, do you feel safe in the home, um, is probably not going to lead to the same sort of answer as doing something one-on-one. -on -one. And a lot of agencies already have dynamic policies where they always just tell people right away, hey, at some point during this assessment, we are going to take you one-on-one -on -one and ask some questions. That's just our protocol. That's just how we do it here. Um, and I don't know if this is as common in sexual assault service providers' worlds to do things one-on-one, -on -one, especially because we know people want to bring in um, folks for support. Um, but again, if they are not alone, it's possible that if we start asking them really personal questions about reproductive health, that they might not want to disclose those concerns um, with a, a partner or a family member or a loved one there. Um, and then third on this uh, initial environment, thinking about multicultural and multilingual materials, I also added mindset because we know that just having a card doesn't mean that um, we're a multicultural environment. Um, so that we can, you know, be responding appropriately to different needs. And this is not coming from me or from CASA. You can see on the bottom of your screen, and we will email these slides out, um, that there's a link to a great document created by Futures Without Violence. And th these are kind of their take-home points that before you start screening, um, and it's written for um, healthcare providers screening for reproductive health issues, but we also believe that these are really good lessons for sexual assault providers screening for reproductive health issues as well. Um, another thing which is probably pretty straightforward, you know, that, that service provider, what would you have done if someone said yes? I don't know. Uh, we really want to make sure that we're prepared for a yes um, and that we know what we would do, who we would go to, who are the agencies who are doing this. Um, and in, in addition to that, you know, making sure that we have that ground core training so that if I'm, you know, as a sexual assault service provider, I hear someone say, yes, I am really worried that I might have STI 
I know what an STI means. You know, I know what some of those basic concerns are. I don't have to be an expert on it, but I at least know enough to talk in an educated manner to talk about what services are going to be offered. It may be my public health clinic, maybe a Planned Parenthood. I'm going to know where they can go. And um, the reason they talk about three types of training is that, you know, with ongoing training, we know folks have new staff coming in that are going to miss things, refresher training, um, because we know we're super, super busy. So just because I learned about something two years ago doesn't mean that if I'm not doing it on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm probably going to need that refresher. And we always, um, in, you know, invest in suggest that people really incorporate skill building into that training because it's one thing for me to sit into a room and say, yeah, I should be asking questions about pregnancy concerns um, to any sexual assault survivors if that's appropriate. Um, and it's another thing to actually practice doing it. So those are just some groundwork things. Again, that resource that's at the bottom of your screen right now is a great place if you want to go to learn more about that, much more in depth than the two seconds I just gave you. And I think, you know, Rose is talking a lot about what you do before you get one, mm -hmm. and that's huge. It's a really huge, important piece um, so that you're not just showing up and asking questions where you're not prepared for whatever, whatever answer you get. Um, one of the things that... Um, they were uh, talking about is was you know, preparing, um, and we were kind of comparing mm -hmm. uh, notes about this, was how much overlap there really was um, between the, the approaches that we were talking about. So obviously when you're a family planning provider and you're asking screening questions about sexual violence, or if you're a sexual violence advocate and you're um, trying to, you're asking questions about um, health concerns, um, the specific questions are going to be different, but the way that you approach it, mm -hmm. there's just so much overlap, um, even when it comes to, like, starting to ask the questions. Um, this was a, so, so we just wanted to sort of start with what that common ground is. And this is a um, screening tool that um, we pulled from the Florida Council Against Sexual Violence. The SAVE um, is SAVE acronym. Um, screen everyone, ask direct questions in a non-judgmental way, validate their responses, evaluate, educate, and make referrals. Really, really applicable um, to both disciplines, even though this came, this develops for folks in the healthcare field. Um, just really quickly about the screen everyone, I think there's a few important things to note about that. Um, screening everyone rather than just the people who look like they might be. <laughs> um, we know that we don't, we're not able to tell by visual cues who um, might have been um, a survivor of sexual violence. Um, and when we do that, when we um, ask questions just of some people, um, we reinforce the stigma that you know, maybe there's something about you that seems like you might be a survivor of sexual violence. Um, and and uh, also, also means that you can miss opportunities to send messages to the people who aren't uh, survivors, but who also, as everyone in society, needs information about this. Um, so going to the second point, you know, when you're asking questions about second sensitive topics like this, and when you ask them for everyone in a just routine, regular way, it's just a matter of fact, non-judgmental, direct, it's normalizing the topic. It's something that we're no longer keeping silent, but we're actually able to discuss. Um, and that can really take away a lot of shame and model a great way of how to deal with these issues directly. Um, validating the responses, but this seems really intuitive. Um, I know that in a busy, you know, if you're busy, it can sometimes be uh, a little bit panicky about them. Like, oh, wow, well, I just got a yes, and now I have to, to really focus on this and be present. Um, and then the final piece is what this project is really geared towards encouraging. So they evaluate, educate, and make referrals. This is where having basic information about the resources of the community comes in. Um, having relationships with other community organizations is really critical. It's so much easier to give a referral than you can say, you know, Kathy over at this agency, the staff there is all great. Um, I, can, I can really recommend they provide these excellent services. It's easier to make those referrals and feel confident and it's also easier um, for, for the person who's getting that referral to feel like this, this is a really positive thing that they might actually want to explore. I'm being told that, my, that I'm still a little quiet, so hopefully 
testing. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. All right. Okay. Um, so then just expanding on that tape model a little bit, a couple of additional things. Um, I feel like these are all going to be really intuitive. And then, um, uh, and then Rose is talking about trauma-informed care a little bit later. It's going to cover a lot of these things, too. So I'll just go over really quickly. Again, this creating the safe space includes me thinking about who's in the room um, and what, what other distractions are there um, so that you can really have the active listening. You can make eye contact, make it clear that you're asking, not because it's part of your, um, your scripts, not because it's one of the things that you're supposed to talk about, but because you genuinely want to hear the answer. Um, normalizing shame and fear are powerfully isolating. We know that. Um, and um, so bringing these issues up and, and simply breaking the silence can be really powerful, even if they choose not to disclose to you at, this, at that time. And later on, we'll talk a little bit about specific examples of questions you might, um, how you might say it, language you might use. Um, and that's going to be something that you can adapt. But the principles, I think, stand across what, whatever sense of the topics that you're screening on. Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to mention is uh, there's, a, there's an MP that I work with in um, Minnesota who does a lot of work with screening um, folks. Um, she's, she does a lot of work around domestic violence and human trafficking. And what, what her image is the open door. You open the door and then um, people may choose to walk through that or not. They may be ready to walk through. They may need time to think about it. But you've established your safe place. You're willing to listen, and that's so important. Um, what if you do get a yes? Obviously, responding with empathy seems pretty obvious. Um, again, if you're busy, it might be, um, you, you know, your first thought might be, oh, no, I just really don't have time to deal with this right now. Um, but making sure that you're present and, and able to respond with empathy, evaluating needs, figuring out what kind of resources a person might be in need of, and then making those referrals. Um, what we hope that you don't come away with from this series is the sense that you need to be able to recite all the information that we've, um, has been shared from the other disciplines. So family planning providers don't need to um, be able to provide um, in-depth counseling on sexual abuse. Advocates don't need to provide counseling on all the available birth control methods. Um, this is what the relationship is for, so that you know enough to help figure out what a person's needs or questions might be, essentially to help triage and then facilitate getting them the resources that um, might help them deal with the questions and issues. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so that's what I want to talk about as far as like, just all of the common mm -hmm. the way that it's Awesome. Thank you for that, um, that background. Um, when we talked about, again, going back to that one example, it's amazing that someone could be asking a question multiple times and no one would ever say yes when we know how common violence is. Anyone who's joined us for some of the previous webinars, we know that people dealing with reproductive health concerns, we know that people dealing with you know, violence in their lives, it's actually very, very common in our state. Um, and so using a model of something like trauma-informed care can help us really get at more of what's happening. It doesn't necessarily mean people will always disclose to us, but we're going to be setting a really nice framework to give people that opportunity if they're in a comfortable place to do so. So moving into that, we have a poll question that we'd like to put up. I'm going to ask Peter to put that on right now. You should see it popping up on your screen in just a second or so. And it's going to ask you um, what your experience is um, up until this point with trauma-informed care. So if you can go ahead and select the one that you think best meets um, your needs and where you're at. Saying either advanced, intermediate, beginner, or I'm not familiar. And maybe choosing submit. Can you see this? No, I cannot. And we'll display those results in just one second. Thank you for doing that. All right. Or we'll just tell you. What are we seeing come in, Peter? Oh, here we go. Awesome. 
Okay, so we see that um, we're, we're definitely not in any one category. 16% not familiar with this concept, 32% beginner, 37% intermediate, and 16% advanced. Um, so seeing that, I'm going to definitely take a little bit of a um, backseat. You can go ahead and take that off the screen. Um, and for those folks out there who, you know, did say that they have kind of an advanced background in this, please feel free to use the chat. Please feel free to raise your hand and unmute if you do have something to share because we really do want to dwell on your expertise. Why do we talk about trauma-informed care? We know that traumatic experiences, so violence, sexual assault, domestic violence, getting a diagnosis of a major health change, all of these things have the potential to be traumatic for people. And it affects our worldview. So we've got this little cartoon, and the boy is saying, whenever I take my bath, I always put my ducky in first. And his tiger asks for companionship, and he says, to test for sharks. I have to give a shout out to CJ, a uh, dexter with End uh, Domestic Abuse Wisconsin. Um, I pulled that from one of his slides. But I think that when we recognize that people are in our rooms, whether the clients we're seeing, and they may have these different worldviews because they're dealing with trauma right now, or they've been dealing with, with for so much of their lives, and now it's complex trauma because there's a new issue, that maybe they're coming from a different frame of mind. The idea of trauma-informed care comes from some really fancy brain science. This is how I like to think about the brain science. We've got the frontal lobe, the other brain pieces, and acute face. And the 101, without you know, pretending to be a neuroscientist without any of that background, is these really smart scientists have actually been able to show that when people experience something that can be traumatic, it chemically alters what is happening in the brain. And the, the short end is that during a trauma, so during something like sexual assault, um, or during the moment where someone is like, oh my gosh, like I have been diagnosed with HIV. Like this could, again, this is not traumatic for everyone, but we know for a lot of people it can be. And during that time, the stress response is to release tons and tons of stress hormones from those other brain pieces into the frontal lobe. I'm pointing, you can't see it. But it goes into the frontal lobe, it's flooding that frontal lobe, and what we actually know is it, it means that we can't think. Like our frontal lobe, that's where we, we do our processing, our thinking, that's where we do our decision making, and we're actually altered and not able to make decisions during that time. Another implication of that is the way we go forward and we remember things is in pieces and we fragment those memories to be able to survive them, and they might come out as very strong senses. And this is why sometimes we see, especially like survivors of sexual assault, might have strong triggers or responses when they have a certain smell or they're in a certain location, um, because that's the way that those things have been stored in their brain. You might be thinking, like, what does this have to do with me screening in a room? It's a really good question. Oh, so the links that just came up, you will get these slides. Those are the really smart people talking about how that actually works. So if you want to learn more about that and you're interested in that brain science, um, the top one by Dr. David Lisak is 34 minutes, and the lower one is, I think, a little closer to an hour by Dr. Rebecca Campbell. But the reason we talk about the way that things are altered in the brain is that it means that when we're dealing with people in our rooms and we're screening on different issues that maybe someone is not prepared to talk about. Like if I'm going to talk to a sexual assault service provider, I might not be prepared to talk about reproductive health issues and vice versa. I mean, I think especially going to, you know, talk about birth control options. Like I'm not expecting someone to ask me about a violence history. Um, or pass. And so we know that when we start asking these questions, we might see all sorts of different responses that might be coming from a point of fear with those things or trauma. We might see people shut down. We see a lot of providers say like, hey, I asked these questions and I just kind of see someone like shut down. They like kind of zone out. It's like they're not really present. Um, you're less likely when screening to see people act aggressively, but sometimes we do see that. Compliant, oh yeah, sure. You know, whatever questions you want to ask, sure, I'll do every anything you say. 
um, it might seem like people are lying. You know, like, do you have any concerns about sexually transmitted infections? And it's a very, like, um, no, no, I, I don't have any concerns about that. It's like, are you lying to me? Um, maybe manipulative, maybe hyper paranoid. But we know because of those changes and the chemical alterations in the brain that those responses are actually serving a purpose. And people aren't acting shut down because they're shut down. They're doing so because they're overwhelmed. They might not be aggressive because they're like a bad person. They're fearful of getting hurt, and that's how they've taken care of themselves in the past. They're avoiding conflict because maybe the last time they were in conflict, that's when something really bad happened. Um, they're not trying to be manipulative. They're trying to get their needs met and maybe not paranoid but fearful. And so understanding before we even ask these questions if this is where people is coming from, people are coming from, can really help inform our responses to them. So what is trauma-informed care? My definition, the Rose Hennessy definition, is that everything we do is based on an understanding of trauma. It's based on an understanding that if we just come in and we have 15 minutes with someone and we are drilling them with questions, and one of the questions is, were you ever sexually assaulted? Were you da da da? We don't expect someone to say yes. That if we're, you know, a sexual assault service provider and we're coming in and we have 74 questions on our intake form and one of them talks about STIs and it's an acronym and we never even explain what that is, that we're probably not going to have people as likely to disclose that. Um, and there's a lot that we can do as organizations and as individuals. The actual definition of trauma-informed care, there are, there are a few, but this is a really nice one. Um, I believe I got this from Elizabeth Hudson, who does some great trauma-informed care work throughout the state, is that this is a strength-based framework that's grounded in an understanding of and responsiveness to the impact of trauma that emphasizes safety for both providers and survivors um, to rebuild a sense of control. And we could also um, rephrase that to both providers and clients or patients, depending on the setting that we're in. We really want to emphasize that this is strength-based, too, um, and that when we're asking things, we're really trying to do things in a way that gives power back to the people that we're asking questions to and giving them back power when they're feeling really powerless about maybe their health or their sexuality or their safety. So what, again, what does that mean when we're actually sitting across from someone at the table? We already talked about maybe talking with someone alone as a good idea. We want to really use some of those active listening skills. We want to be sitting down. We want to try to reduce distractions. So if there's a million things going on, how can we try to put those million things to the side? Not just in a physical environment, but actually in our presence with, with, a, with a client or with a patient. You know, if we are using a screening tool, are we maintaining eye contact? Are we finding a way to convey that the topic and the answers are important? And, you know, since we all come from different cultures and the people we're serving are from different cultures. Active listening might look different with different people. And, you know, that's really awesome and that's that's okay too. And it might look different as from you as a provider because everyone's going to have a slightly different style and they're going to set the stage in a slightly different way. You know, we really want to normalize. We are talking about some of the most stigmatized topics. You know, we were like, let's combine the two things that no one in Wisconsin wants to talk about and do some webinars on them. Um, and, you know, so normalizing that, normalizing that this is really hard. I'm going to ask you, maybe instead of just going through that checklist, you're going to take five seconds to say, you know, maybe you're not here today because you're thinking about health concerns, but I care so much about you as a client, or I mean, maybe that's too personal. We, you know, we really care about you, and so we're going to ask you some of those questions because we know that multiple people who have had the experiences that you have had might have, you know, some concerns and issues, and um, we're normalizing that. That's normal. We expect that to be the case. We're going to educate you, again, within our reason. Um, we're going to provide context to those questions so we're not just throwing them off of intake forms. And we really want to make the connection, too. That can be really small. Like, I'm going to ask 
some questions about um, sexual assault. I ask that to all of my clients, and I do, or all of my patients, and I do that because there, we know that there's a really, really high overlap between physical health and sexual violence, so I feel like that's part of my job to do that. One sentence, five seconds, not based in tons of research or statistics, but it's helping the people in the room to understand why these things that maybe they didn't come in to talk about are important. Of course, we're asking non-judgmental questions. Um, that seems very straightforward, but as we get on, it, it, it can be more difficult. Even, even something like asking, like, oh, well, was a condom used during that experience? That might come off as really judgmental, because if that person didn't have any control over what was happening, they might feel like they're being judged on top of that, that there, there also um, wasn't protection in that way. Obviously, we want to have compassion, and I think like the hardest thing to think about is this patience concept, because especially for your family planning providers, we know you're seeing tons of people coming through your doors. For your sexual assault folks, you're not just seeing advocacy clients, you're also out doing prevention, and you've got support groups, and you also maybe even have a life outside of your work, which is awesome. Um, and we want you to have that, and that patience when we're talking about these hard things, like we know that our clients, our the victims and survivors, they're going to need more time to answer these questions. They're going to need more time if we're really going to empower them to make decisions to walk through that process. So someone saying, yes, this is a concern for me, and me handing them a card and saying, you should call someone and get some help for that, and walking away is not... I mean, it's an option, but from a compassionate and patient place, you know, maybe saying, here are some options. What can I best help you with? And the reason I think it's worth that extra five to ten minutes to do that is because we know that if we don't address these concerns, people might have them the rest of their lives, and it's going to impact multiple other areas of their health and well-being. And so for us taking that extra 10 minutes with someone who is dealing with one of these issues might be life-changing for, the for the rest of their lives. And so, you know, trying to find that time within reason while setting up boundaries is definitely not easy. Um, and then my favorite part about this sort of trauma-informed care philosophy that we're coming at clients with an understanding that they might be dealing with trauma is that we know they could be in really dark places. If I was raped and I'm concerned that I might be pregnant, oh my gosh, that could feel like such a dark place for me. Um, it might feel like there's no way out. I might just be in total fear and shock. And so as service providers, when we can, you know, be calm, we can come from that patient, compassionate place, but we can also promote healing, you know, and, and talking about how, like, there are options. People do get through this. Recovery is possible. We might be the first people that they ever hear that from. And that's also really powerful and a great opportunity for us when working with folks. Um, so this might be very 101 for some of you, um, but we think it, it applies across fields, things that you might be able to say, I'm really sorry that happened to you. No one deserves to be treated that way. This wasn't your fault. Again, you know, whether we're talking about violence or someone contracting an STI or an unplanned pregnancy, we know from our first webinar that a lot of people become pregnant even when they're using birth control options um, and there's a failure rate. If you hear someone specifically stating a feeling, I'm so, or, or a state of being, I'm so confused about what's happening, or I'm just so angry, you know, validating that. You have every right to be angry. I'm just so sad. You have every right to be sad. Again, we're not ever asking you to be experts across topics. So saying something like, I know experts that can help with this sort of thing. Would you be interested in talking with them? Um, since we know this is hard to talk about validating that, thank you for telling me. I imagine that it must be really hard to talk about something like this. If that doesn't sound like something you would ever say, you know, taking that same concept and what are the words that you would use to convey that same kind of message. 
And again, always, you know, trying to say recovery is possible. Even something like, I was talking about this with Michelle, even with a diagnosis of an STI or an STD, you know, there's a lot of treatment. There are a lot of options that in the past maybe some of those things might have been a death sentence or a much shortened life, but we know that there, there's a really good chance that people can live great, healthy, productive lives no matter what's help happening to them in these areas. Um, and then, you know, what can we do in addition to that? Um, again, maybe not just throwing a card at someone, but having materials available. Um, do you need a phone? To call? Do you need a confidential place? Um, maybe we have an extra room that we do screenings in that we can have someone in. Would you like me to make a call with you? As advocates, maybe do you want me to even go with you to see a family planning provider? We have that option to, you know, do accompaniment when time allows. Um, letting them know that they can always come back. You know, so if I'm a family planning provider and working with someone and, you know, they do disclose uh, maybe an incident of sexual assault, um, and I say, wow, you know, here are some options, and they say, yeah, you know, that sounds like a really good thing. I think that I want to go and talk to someone. You're like, wow, after you do that, you can come back and talk to me. We can process that experience. Um, you know, we can figure out what other options you need. Or maybe... Um, we have to do a follow-up for you anyways, like you're due for your pap smear in three months or something. So when you come back, maybe we can check back in about that and see if that's working for you, if there are other things that we could do or there are other options that might work. Mm -hmm. um, and then, oh, hold on one second. Am I supposed to say that? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, someone gave me a comment in the chat. Thanks for that. Um, and to these last two comments, this idea of really giving power back. Um, shared power is one of the, the strongest components of a trauma-informed network. So what would you like to do? What makes the most sense for you? You know best what you need. Um, we really believe that the people coming in, they've got good head on their shoulders. Even if they're dealing with trauma, they're going to be able to make the best choices for themselves. And I'm going to hand it over to Michelle and talk. She can talk about the, the more fun experiences on that side. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, for those of you who attended the WIFRA meeting back in April, um, this was just all of it down really smooth. I totally just stole this for Rose. Um, and I have to admit that I have um, mixed feelings about like the what to avoid lists. I'm one of those people that I have a long list of things not to do. Um, I can tend to become uh, paralyzed. Um, start second guessing, oh, I said one of the things I shouldn't do. And, and really what I would urge you to do is go back to the list of what to say um, and just like spend time with that rather than a lot of time with the, I shouldn't do this, I should never do this, I say this, I totally messed up this person's entire life and it's bad. Um, but I do at the same time think it's helpful to consider um, some common maybe feel intuitive responses that might not be as helpful um, if we take a little time to, to reflect on, on those. Um, the, oh my gosh, this is terrible, this is the worst thing I've ever heard. Um, you know, the, have being, having a calm response. Um, and again, I think you know, we'll get lots of examples, but I believe you, and I'm so sorry this happened to you, um, is, is really about as good as you can um, compared to some of these. Um, really are the top responses. A couple of other things here, most of the middle ones, you should, you must, you need to, this is what best, you'll feel better if you. Um, all of these, I think, get at the same thing, that um, often I think these are very common responses, and as helping professionals, we want to help. We want to make things better in really concrete, tangible ways. Um, so it can be easy to slip into that kind of language. Um, what we're not intending to do, and what we may do if, if we're using kinds of language is undermining a person's autonomy. Um, they don't need to be told what to do. Um, they need to know that you're there to support them in their process, whatever that looks like for them. And that's by far the most important thing that we can offer, either as advocates or um, family planning providers, um, making sure that they know that you're there for them, whatever that process is going to be. You can open the door, and they're in control. I think um, the one example that's really outside of this realm um, of one of the dynamics that can happen is um, 
you know, I, I think it's pretty common that nobody wants to disappoint their prospective professional, whether it's your therapist or your doctor or your dentist. And if your dentist tells you that you should floss and you agree that you're going to floss and then you don't floss and you have best intentions to floss, and then maybe you don't want to go back to the dentist because you failed your dentist. Um, and that's a dynamic that can happen. Um, and so we need to be careful that we're not telling people what to tell me what to. But it's helpful if we can, be, if we can avoid um, phrases like that. That, that set up a dynamic where you are going to be disappointed if they don't do something, or they might believe that. Um, and then, of course, the last one, you know, jumping to words like rape, domestic violence, abuse, if those aren't words that the person has identified with, that, um, those can be alien, alienating. Um, using the own, uh, person's own language or describing specific behaviors can help with that. Um, you can um, say it sounds like he's isolating you from your friends, um, it sounds uh, like uh, different you know, situations sound like that, that may not be healthy, um, but to jump into using the words domestic violence, that might be off-putting. Might, somebody might not be ready to identify with that word. Um, so that's why we have that last one on there. Um, it's not that those are words that we need to completely avoid, and, um, but wait until a person may be ready to identify with us. <laughs> uh, before I move on, there was a, a great comment in the chat, someone saying, you know, can you address secondary trauma and this idea that when we're asking people about experiences that either we ourselves have already experienced or we connect it to previous clients or victims that we've talked to, that can be really difficult for us and that can cause triggers in us that are really challenging. So maybe... You know, if I'm asking questions and I recently had a pregnancy scare and now I'm dealing with someone who's like, oh, my gosh, I might be pregnant. I don't know what that looks like. You know, that might be bringing things up in me. And it's important that as service providers we recognize that, that that, again, is really normal. That's going to happen to us. Um, but that we also probably need to make sure we have safe spaces then to process that? Do we have a supervisor? Do we have a colleague that we can talk to, that we can let those things out, um, that we can be aware, we can set up good boundaries with clients? Um, at least with sexual assault service providers, we're always thinking about, you know, you want so much to help people, um, but giving out a personal number and taking a call at midnight is probably not setting up a good boundary. Um, that might, you know, lead to a higher likelihood of of dealing with secondary or sometimes we call it helper's trauma. So thanks so much for the person who put that in our chat. So we're sort of moving on. We had three parts of our webinar today. We gave like the background on assessment and referral. Now Michelle and I are both going to take a few minutes to talk about tools. Um, this is specifically for sexual assault advocates that you might be able to think about or use when screening. And then Michelle will be doing it specifically for family planning. Um, and then after that, we're actually going to have some people who work in the field come on and talk about tools that they may have used and experiences they may have had. Um, and I think we'll have to do this a little bit quicker, too, because it's 12.15. Um, so I've got a poll question for you. I'm going to ask Peter to put that up. Um, for sexual assault service providers, if you can answer or give the response that best describes how you screen for reproductive health concerns right now, you'll see there are five options. You might read it and be like, none of those options work for me. And that's totally okay, too. If you want to write in the chat other um, and say maybe what you're doing, that would be great. And if you can go ahead and show that to everyone. Oh, okay. It looks like stuff's still coming in. We'll give it another minute or so. You can take a nice big sip of coffee or tea while you wait. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So here are some of the responses we see from um, sexual assault service providers. 8% of folks saying, I don't screen. 23% um, if a client mentions a concern, we'll discuss options. 38% um, talking about general health concerns. Um, and then a third of the folks on saying that they are asking questions about reproductive health to all clients. 
Um, so that's great. If you can, you can go ahead and put that um, back away, Peter. Thank you. So for folks who are asking questions to um, either those general health questions or those reproductive health questions to all people, can you go ahead and maybe share in the chat what questions it is that you're asking. I mean, obviously, we don't expect you to remember them word for word, um, but maybe a general idea, or if you say the same thing over and over again, you may actually remember it word for word. And Peter, if you can let me know if anything comes in. Okay, so always giving you that option. Um, we'll come back to that. My status when doing research and even contacting some national folks in our field is that there are few tools available specifically for sexual assault service providers to screen on reproductive health concerns. Um, and that was, you know, why we were asking, does anyone have any questions or tools that they are using? Because um, if you're using something you think it's awesome, we would love to, to know about it and be able to promote it further. As a result of that, um, here at our State Coalition with some partners, we're actually starting to draft some questions and try to create some screening tools. Um, so we wanted to throw out some of our initial, initial um, questions that we have coming up. We, we thought about it, and obviously we're going to ask different questions depending on if someone comes within 24 hours of being sexually assaulted, within a week, within two months, within 20 years. We know that we're seeing people in all those different stages. So um, for acute trauma, obviously we're asking people questions about whether they want a SANE, sexual assault nurse examiner, um, or exam, excuse me, um, or maybe forensics and reporting, but other acute trauma questions that we thought about. Sometimes people we talk to have concerns about their physical health. We'd like to ask you a few questions to support you with any concerns you may have. Is now a good time to talk about this? Sometimes we don't always have that liberty because we're only meeting with them once, so this is the time. But if we have that ability, that's a nice trauma-informed principle. Um, even though the chance of pregnancy may be low, sometimes it can be a big worry, and that's normal. If it is something you're worried about, we can talk about options. Is that a concern for you? Um, and then lastly, sexually transmitted diseases can be tracked, contracted in a number of ways, including blank, I'll come back to that. Of course, there's testing available and resources for treatment if needed. Are these something you're worried about? Um, the reason we left that space open is because, you know, as advocates, when we're screening, we're getting pieces of the story. You know, so even with that pregnancy question, Obviously, we're not going to be asking that to male victims or male-identified folks um, or, you know, if they've already expressed that it's male-on-male -male or female-on-female -female violence, we're, we're not going to ask a pregnancy question because that's not um, appropriate. But, we, you know, with STDs, we might know a little bit about what they've already gone through because they've disclosed it. So they said, you know, so-and-so touched me in this way. Um, they took off my clothes. They were... Um, you know, rubbing up against me, they, they were forcing me to do that. Um, well, if we have general knowledge of something like genital herpes, we know that skin-to-skin -skin contact, can that could be a way that something like that might be contracted. So maybe saying contracted in a number of ways, including skin-to-skin -skin contact. If someone talked about oral sex as part of the sexual assault, you know, maybe specifically saying that so that it's very appropriate to what they're going through. And the reason we think it's important to maybe give some of that context is we all know what our reproductive health educations look like growing up. Um, and it's really possible that people don't know all the possible ways that, that something could be contracted. So again, these are things that we're just throwing out. Um, if you have any initial thoughts or feedback, we'd love for you to, to email us, throw that into a chat, um, etc. I've got to go a little bit faster. So then we thought about non-acute or past trauma. Um, we know that people who have been through experiences like this can sometimes have long-term health issues. For instance, that can be linked to, again, maybe filling in the same symptoms that you've heard um, a victim already talk about 
for a generic answer, we said chronic headaches, reproductive health concerns, or even some conditions that don't have any symptoms. Um, I want to make sure you're getting the best care possible. Do you have a doctor or other health care provider that you feel comfortable talking to about this? Um, and again, this language might not work well for you. It might not work well for your clients. You might need to adapt that to fit better into your community. You might need to translate it into a different language. Um, but we're trying to throw out some general concepts of things that we could be asking. And then third, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this because this kind of, um, these are good questions for both family planning providers and sexual assault providers. Um, Futures Without Violence created this kind of screening question intake card, and you can see it up there. Um, you can download it for free. Um, if you pay a small shipping fee, you can order like hundreds of them um, online. The link is up there. And so here's some of the, the questions that it has. Um, and Oh, sorry, going back to that screen, we think about this as sexual assault that would be happening within an intimate partner violence situation. So someone who's already dealing with domestic violence, partner violence, um, and might also be worried about sexual assault. So they've got some nice healthy relationship questions, but on the bottom, like, does my partner mess with my birth control or try to get me pregnant when I don't want to be? Actually, there we go. Oh, it's in a red box. Um, does my partner refuse to use condoms when I ask? Does my partner make me have sex when I don't want to? So these are some really great things we can be screening for, thinking about, or asking. Um, you know, even saying, like, am I afraid to even ask my partner to use condoms? Am I afraid my partner would hurt me if I told him I had an STD and he needed to be treated too? Um, thinking about the language, thinking about, again, pregnancy is not going to be an issue in every concern. In these questions, they're assuming that a perpetrator is male. We know that might not always be the case. Um, so encourage you to, to look through, and, and those are some options, and hopefully we'll have more tools for you um, in that June event for things that you can question and screen on. Okay, great. Um, so I, the next couple of slides, um, I'll just fly through those real quick so you see which ones I'm talking about. Um, these slides are um, some example language. We wanted to provide a little bit of that for all of you. Again, um, what you specifically say is not so much important as how you say it, um, but it, and making sure that you're saying it in a way that it feels natural to you, that you can do consistently, that's connecting with your um, patients. Um, so these are just a couple examples that you can read through and um, your own time as you're reflecting on how you might want to talk to your um, clients about this. Um, but I want to get to the um, resources because there are some really good ones, and honestly most of the, the phrasing on the last four slides comes from some of these resources. Um, this one uh, that's on the screen right now is like by far the, the best resource that I came across. Mm -hmm. Second that. Um, yeah, <laughs> this is a really good one. Assessing Patients for Sexual Violence, a Guide for Healthcare Providers. It's only eight pages long, um, has a lot of great information and background. I would really urge you to, to take a look at that. If you're coming to the conference, we'll probably give you a free one, So, um, but, but it's a really great resource. Um, oh, sorry, that's me. Okay, so the next uh, thing that I wanted to show you was a Medscape article that recently came out, um, which does a nice job of summarizing the current thinking about why to do screening in um, a medical setting and what resources are available, um, and that seemed really timely. The next one on the slides is a great compilation of different assessment tools. It's a 120-page big honkin' book um, that has just... a slew of different um, tools for assessment, a lot of mnemonic devices. Um, this is where the save uh, tool came from, and they've got a ton like that. Uh, Rose already talked about the Futures with Violence, and they've got a lot of different resources, um, information for providers, posters to hang in exam rooms, the pocket safety cards that she showed. Um, those are also available in Spanish, um, and, and most of these focus on the health impacts of interpersonal or domestic violence, so a really great resource there. Um, and really quickly, I wanted to mention the ASVAST. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with this, the Adolescent Sexual Violence Abuse Screening Tool. Um, 
And I wanted to touch on this because it's a little bit different. It's not, it's not really uh, a series of questions intended to be asked of patients the way you might use other screening tools, um, but a tool to help you sort out whether a situation warrants a report to law enforcement or child protective services. So this sort of assumes, well, it not sort of, definitely assumes that you're already familiar with the laws around mandatory reporting mm -hmm. and your agency's policies. So if you're not, that needs to be the starting place. Um, and it's obviously outside the scope of what we're going to be talking about today, but it's really important that as mandatory reporters, and which healthcare providers are, that you know what those obligations are. And then based on that knowledge, many situations are going to be pretty clear, um, very black and white, um, but this is a tool to help you think through the factors that would warrant reporting based on what you know about the patient in the situation. So again, it's not a like, I'm going to ask you, um, do you lack the attention span to have a productive discussion? Do you uh, ask inappropriate questions or make bizarre statements? <laughs> Is your partner a caregiver or a relative? Um, do you have an obvious cognitive delay or disability? Uh, those kind of questions, obviously, it's for your own assessment. Um, so I just wanted to just quickly talk about it can be a really useful tool when, when you're trying to figure out, is this a situation that I should be reporting? I feel there's something about this situation that, that's making me uncomfortable. Normally, I might not even consider reporting to 17-year-olds um, in a voluntary situation or um, whatever the situation is, but there's something about the situation that um, is making me uncomfortable. You can go through this checklist and think, okay, there are some red flags, so I am going to go ahead and report. I'll also just um, encourage you, in much the same way that um, you know we're we're talking about building relationships between the family planning providers and the advocates, um, building a relationship with your um, child protective services can be really useful. If you know who those people are, and if you've talked to them, and if you if you've gone through hypothetical situations, what happens in this situation? What happens in that situation? Um, then it takes a situation that can be really stressful and help reduce that, like reduce the number of unknowns to you. Um, one question that I would encourage you to ask of the folks that you meet uh, at CPS is whether they're open to hypothetical questions. Um, could you, if you had a situation come up that you really, you just didn't know, um, could you call them and ask them hypothetically without having to necessarily start a report? Um, because some people have really found that to be helpful um, to to rely on them as guidance um, when, when you're not sure about what needs to happen. And then with all of these tools, just the one thing that I would reiterate is just the importance of opening the door to these conversations. Not all survivors are going to be ready to talk to you when you um, uh, ask, um, and others are going to Others will file it away for future reference and maybe talk to you next time. So um, not having people disclose to you doesn't mean that you've failed to reach them. Um, and so I just want to give you that um, sense that just asking the questions makes a huge difference, and you're doing a huge amount of good um, by opening that door. So with that... We'll go ahead and uh, listen to somebody who actually knows what she's talking about, Jay Hay. Um, and we're trying to get that set up right now. So, Jay. Okay, so I'm going to start by apologizing for Jane, not Jay. So I'm so sorry. Um, oh. can, yeah, Jay, can you go ahead and just try and test and we'll see if your sound is there? Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, if yeah. there's any way that you can maybe turn the volume up just a little bit higher on your computer or your microphone um, or telephone, but it sounds great. And again, Jay, not Jane, my apologies. She's coming from St. Croix County Public Health. And I'm actually, uh, we've got, we got some of your feedback from our last webinar that it really helps when we have some kind of visual to go along with the talking. So I'm actually going to let Michelle walk through and ask her four questions. Oh, okay. Um, I turned my volume down. Okay, so um, we had a couple of questions that we set out for each of our um, mm -hmm. folks coming in from the various fields. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Jay, what interpersonal violence issues have you come across when working with clients? Well, Michelle, I've been doing this for a long time, as many of um, the rest of the family planning um, providers have been doing, but certainly I've seen a wide gamut of um, a lot of violence. Um, over time. Um, domestic violence, all, all kinds, the verbal, emotional, physical, sexual. 
Um, unfortunately, I've seen sexual assault um, to all degrees. We've um, come across, across some sexual coercion. Um, we had a teenager who had a you know, little part-time job at a cafe, and she had a positive chlamydia. Well, upon investigation, we found out that her sexual partner was her boss, and he was 19. So, I mean, so abuse in that regard. We had a young man who um, had some STDs. He was exchanging sex um, for rides with truckers at one of our truck stops on I-94. Um, we've had a Hispanic mother who, during her own um, physical and well woman exam, shared that she was worried about incest with her um, her eight year old daughter um, that might be occurring when the daughter would visit her dad. Unfortunately, we've, we're close to the cities here, and we've had a number of teens who have gotten into um, being sex slaves. They kind of got into prostituting and then were not able to leave um, on their own free will. Um, they got kind of um, taken hostage by gang members. Um, we've seen some clients who had terrible sexual in injuries after um, extensive meth use. Um, they would get into um, extensive acts of sex that lasted days upon time and then they were um, had a lot of trauma to their genitals, then they would come for help. We've had some mail order brides that um, came here, one from Eastern Europe and one from um, Asia, and um, we suspected that they were in a um, situation that was out of their control. So I think we've kind of seen gamut, as I'm sure the other family planning providers have. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting that even as somebody who has, you know, I um, have a background in working with um, the in the sexual violence advocacy field mm -hmm. and then in family planning, and I know that all kinds of sexual violence happens in rural areas and urban areas. It doesn't matter where you live; these things happen. And I still find that I have a little bit of um, expectation, like, "Oh man, really?" in in Saint Croix. Um, mm -hmm. it, and it's interesting to notice that own that bias in my own self that that it, it really is something that all of us are dealing with, whether whether we're seeing it in the clients or not, um, whether we're asking it or not, it's there. So um, let's see, what was the back one? Sorry, thank mm -hmm. you, Rhodes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you screen for a history of sexual assault or domestic violence when working with family planning clients? And if so, what questions are you asking? Well, of course we screen from the second we take a phone call to make an appointment um, until they walk out the door. And so, I mean, it is just a process that we use. Even our frontline staff, um, sometimes the gals in the office will say, well, you know, her husband made the appointment and um, asked all the questions. And or they'll say the partner, the male partner, um, filled out all the paperwork. Didn't ever fill out any of the paperwork. Um, so I think we are constantly screening. Um, we do have our questionnaires. Yes, we do. And makes me think about them twice because um, they're basically our guidelines and they're mandated for use. And on those questionnaires, we ask, you know, all the questions about um, are they afraid of someone? Um, do they feel threatened? Do they have concerns about forced or unwanted sex, physical abuse, date rape? Um, but I, I think our screening goes well beyond those questions. Um, we ask about when they were first sexually active. Um, we ask what kind of STD risk they may have. We assess their pregnancy risk. Um, and so we get all kinds of cues, clues about the entire process. You know, we have, we know that we, sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's, right out there. We know people will walk right in and say, you know, I've been raped. You said your reproductive health department, I need your help. And then to the point where we have to really try to assess um, through nonverbal cues, body language. Um, my friend Gina in County tells, tells me about the heart syndrome, the person who's there all the time, frequent appointments for STDs, pelvic checks. 
The woman who's always complaining about pain with sex never has an orgasm. Um, the partner, either male or female, who is afraid to negotiate condom use with their partners. Or the client who puts off their physical exam over and over and over. They're six months out. They need their physical, but they always um, miss those appointments. Um, the clients mm -hmm. who their pills were thrown out or they want birth control that um, depot because it'll be confidential. So I think we're constantly assessing and screening every one of our clients at every visit. Mm -hmm. So then how do you make referrals to the advocacy service providers when you are getting, um, you know, when you are getting the positive screens? Well, I kind of um, divided this, uh, my thoughts, into um, minors and adults because, you know, adults have that choice to proceed on their own, but minors do not. And over the years that I've been doing this, I've worked a lot with teens. I end up, if I feel I have um, criteria and that a minor um, is, a victim, I, I tell them I'm going to be reporting. And, you know, that's always the question. Should I tell them and have somebody call them later? But in my clinic, I always tell um, the minor that, you know, this is something um, I have to report. Um, and so, like you said earlier, Michelle and Rose said, you have to know who your referral agencies are. In our county, Anybody that um, is a minor, but if it is not a family member or a caretaker, I have to call the police department. Um, and sometimes it depends on where they live, where the crime was committed. You have to know who your, your the staff are. If it's the county sheriff, there's certain sheriff uh, I, would, I would call. Um, and if it is a caretaker, then it's the child protection. So I let them know that I'm going to make this call. Um, and sometimes it, you know, destroys the relationship that we have. Um, I listen patiently to their story and share with them, you know, and, and point it out, you know, this is illegal. Um, but I, I have to report this um, because we have to... Um, we have to report, you know, we can't um, shirk that duty. For adults, certainly I can talk to them about, you know, what their options are. You can, we could call the police. You can call now, you can call later. Um, we have a SART Center, a sexual assault response team in our community, that's three counties. Um, I call if the client wants me to at that point, and we make arrangements for the same to nurse to meet them either at their SART center or at the nearest emergency room. So it just really depends on the situation and if that mm -hmm. client needs my help or wants to pursue it on their own. Right. Right. So sometimes you're helping facilitate, actively facilitate those referrals, and other times you're giving the information and then... Um, you know, making sure that they have that so when they leave later, they can. Um, I'm trying to advance to the next slide. Oh, here, can here's one. There we go. Okay, so um, can you leave us with one important lesson that you've learned working with clients with a history of sexual violence? Well, Michelle, you asked me to leave with one, but I, I had <laughs> just one. So I was thinking of the most important points. Um, you might have to ask five or six times. You might see that client five or six times before they feel safe enough. This is a place um, where they can trust you. And my other thought was that no victim looks the same, male, female. Their, their reaction, their trauma, and their recovery is all going to be individual and different. And probably the hardest lesson that I've had to come to grips with over all these years is that not all victims have the means or the strength to leave a violent or abusive relationship, and some choose to stay. And that, for me, is sometimes the hardest thing to um, deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Tay. Mm -hmm. And thanks again for coming on and sharing that. 
Um, so it's great to get a family planning perspective. Um, now we'd like to bring in a wonderful advocate from Jefferson County. Um, I'm really pr uh, happy to pr uh, introduce Alma Mann. She works for People Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Alma, can you say hello? Hello. Oh, your audio sounds perfect. So uh, we have very similar questions for you. Um, I guess I just want to start by asking, um, well, one, maybe I'll say, Alma, how long have you been doing sexual assault work? Um, I've been working, uh, you know, focusing on um, primarily with sexual assault victims uh, for four years now. Awesome. awesome. Great. So in those four years, what reproductive health issues have you come across when you're working with clients? One of the most common ones that I have encountered, you know, and when asking the right questions or when clients feel comfortable enough to disclose on their own is, uh, you know, chlamydia is, seems to be one of the big ones. Uh, and also, um, you know, the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not every client that comes to the door that has been sexually assaulted, you know, may be pregnant, but they have, that's their main concern, you know, especially when the assault took place, like, totally unexpectedly, and they were not on any birth control. So uh, I think uh, that's one of the main concerns that the clients uh, have, especially the youngest ones, you know, um, between, I'm going to say, 14 and 18. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So, um, you know, you've seen some of those things. Are you screening for any reproductive or general health concerns when you do see those clients? And if so, what questions are you asking? You know, um, yes, I mean, we definitely do. Uh, you know, one of the first questions when a client that has been, like, sexually assaulted comes to our door, uh, you know, our main concern is, uh, you know, their uh, safety and health. Uh, so uh, we don't know. We want to know you know, how long ago the uh, assault uh, took place. That way, you know, if the client needs to go to see the same um, nurse, you know, we can, mm -hmm. I can actually provide transportation if she doesn't have any, and I will be with her through the whole, you know, process. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the questions that I ask some of my clients, uh, you know, to start the topic of conversation is, um, you know, the questions that I'd be asking you may be very personal, and it is not my intention to make you feel uncomfortable, you know, but your answers uh, may be very important, so I know how to help you better, you know, and support you. Are, are, are you concerned about, you know, uh, pregnancy, or are you concerned about STDs? Do you know what STDs are? Because, you know, some of the... Uh, some of the clients, they are not familiar with, like, STDs until you actually explain to them mm -hmm. what they are or give them an example of them. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That, that's, that's fantastic. So, you know, when you're asking those questions and you do hear that someone says, you know, yes, that is a concern for me, um, how are you making referrals or what, is that what do the next steps look like? What are you saying or what's happening next? Um, you know, I, of course, you know, uh, there's always the, I guess, the line of questioning depending on how the communication is going. Um, you know, she may not be forthcoming right away. So, you know, I may just talk about, you know, I have worked with some other women or young girls that are concerned about this. You know, do you have similar type of concerns? You know, mm -hmm. uh, but it's like I I don't know. I try to make them feel comfortable, and you know, I want them to be like open to the information. I, it's their choice if they you know want to take the next step. I always, you know, let them know how important it is, you know, to take control of their lives, 
especially if they have been sexually assaulted, and that you know I can sit with he, with uh, I can sit here with them, uh, pick up the phone and make the phone call for them or dial the number, or I can provide the number for them if they feel more comfortable on making the phone call, or if they are not ready, you know that's totally fine. It's it's up to them. I provide the information and I lay options on the table, but, you know, I, I encourage them, of course, to, you know, make the phone call or, you know, get treated or get some answers from the same nurse or a physician. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Adma. And then, you know, again, just one same last question. What's one important lesson you've learned when working with clients with reproductive health concerns? Wow, that question, I mean, it's a really good question, and, you know, I mean, it all depends. It all depends because I guess one of the things that I want to mention before answering the question is that it has been challenging for me as an advocate to work with victims of sexual assault that have, you know, mental health issues or cognitive mm -hmm. disabilities. Okay. Because some of them actually, um, you know, some of them had their uh, tubes tied since a very early age or young age, as you say, because they were more like, you know, prone to be sexually assaulted because they were unable to give consent. Um, so one of the things that I have learned, you know, from working with them, I guess, is to, you know, Treat everyone with dignity and respect and validate, you know, their feelings, their options. And, you know, I think it has made me a better listener. You know, um, I, I, I do, I have learned a great deal um, from them, you know, their feelings, their uh, bad experiences. And, um, and I think... Uh, you know, it's, it has helped me to build a better relationship, you know, now that I'm a better listener. Um, I, uh, I have learned to res respect their choices, of course, you know, and opinions. And again, you know, more than anything, validate their feelings and, you know, um, again, treat them with dignity and respect, you know, no matter what. Awesome. Alma, thank you so much for sharing. Um, we're going to keep both Jay and Alma on the line. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, and if you remember in the, the beginning of the webinar, I said when we can incorporate skill building in practice, it's always fantastic for training. So um, I'm going to try to keep my word to that. I'm also going to ask you to do something new with technology. So if any of you just had a stress response to that, it's, hopefully it'll be okay. I'm going to demonstrate to you. We've got a few case studies. We might not get through all of them in the next 10 minutes, but we'll get through at least one or two. Um, and I want you to be able to respond in what you would say or do in the responses that, or in the situations that we're going to come forward. We wanted to give you an anonymous platform to do that, and we also wanted to do it in a way where everyone could see a response. So I'm going to demonstrate. We're going to use a program. It's called Poll Everywhere. And I come up here and I'll start it. And you'll see something that comes up on the screen that looks like this. This is our test question. What is the best flavor of ice cream? So I'm going to remember this number. It's turning red on your screen. I'm going to go to polleverywhere.com. Clicking on that right now. Actually, I don't think I'm going to click on it. I'm going to just pull it up on my web browser. Okay. So here's my web browser. I put in polleverywhere.com. There was that six-digit number. You will have it up on your screen. It's nine. For this one, it's different for each question. And then I'm going to answer with whatever I want. So cookie dough is actually, let's be real, chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream is my favorite. I'll hit Submit Response, and you'll see something green that says we received your response. And now, when I come back to my PowerPoint, 
Wink. You will see that response up on the screen. Loading in just one second. <laughs> So there it is. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you to do that right now. I want you to minimize your screen, open a web browser or another browser, write in polleve.com, put in that six-digit number that's red. I put my cursor over it. And then type in your favorite flavor of ice cream. Thanks, Michelle. All right, peanut butter and cookie dough, also a good choice. <laughs> if anyone has questions on how exactly this works, you can put it in our chat or you can raise your hand. Mint chocolate chip, delicious. I know it can be a little interesting to navigate the browser, so we're going to give you one or one more minute to kind of play around with it. Chocolate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, chocolate chip cheesecake. Oh, my gosh, that sounds delicious. Caramel swirl. We do have maybe a little bit of a chocolate audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm in total agreement here. <laughs> okay, just going to give one more moment, because I know we've got 25 on, and we've got maybe five or six responses. Of course, not everyone will feel comfortable. One of the nice things about this mm -hmm. is if there's things that you don't feel comfortable sharing with your name attached, it's anonymous. So mm -hmm. that's one of the neat things that we wanted to try with this poll. Mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. And it allows you to give the, mm -hmm. a full response instead of picking one <laughs> out of a list. So it's kind of cool if you, if you mm -hmm. want to give it a try. All right. Um, so if you are, if this is like, whoa, please stop the technology madness, you can always put it in the chat. We've got banana peanut butter. Awesome. <laughs> Moose tracks. Another chocolate. Great. If this is something that you like, too, this is a free program for up to 40 responses, so there's a technology plug for you. You can use it in presentations. You can also, there's a, there's a texting option, but sometimes it costs for providers. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop that poll, and now we're actually going to make this more relevant to um, the work that we're doing today. So doing the same exact thing, you go, you go to pollev.com. But this time you put in this four-digit number, that six-digit number that's slightly different. You might want to write that down. Case scenario, you ask a client if she has ever experienced sexual assault. The client becomes non-responsive and stops answering any questions. What would you do or say next? Thinking about the trauma-informed care model we brought about, thinking about some of the, the great things that our local providers came on to say. We're going to, we know it takes a few minutes to formulate thoughts and do text, so we're literally going to just give you a minute or two of silence. So, so if I wanted to respond to this, I open a browser, I type in pollev.com, I enter the 982632, and then right after that number, I type in whatever my response is, hit send, and then it comes up on the screen. Beautiful. Great, we see some responses coming in. Thanks so much for putting these up. I'll read them off while other folks might be still typing. I would give the client a few minutes, and if there's no re response, I would reassure a client that it is confidential and completely their choice. Someone says, I would say, sometimes this topic is difficult to talk about, but I'm here to listen and help you. Another one. 
you could validate that this is a difficult topic to talk about and give them time, space to process. Awesome. Another, say nothing, be patient. We are a safe place for you to discuss these concerns. <laughs> Again, you appear uncomfortable. I understand this may be difficult to talk about. I'm here for you. Awesome. Um, so if Alma and uh, Jay are on the line, or Michelle, any thoughts that you see on these responses that you'd want to share? Um, I think they're doing a great job. You know, you might say, unfortunately, um, sexual assault is all too common. Um, your silence says that um, this is a very sensitive subject for you. Or has something happened to you or someone close to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree, Michelle. I think most of the, all of the responses are pretty good. Actually, you know, I I use some of those very similar to those. Uh, and uh, you know, another one that I use is is someone threatening you, or are you afraid of someone? Uh, because sometimes, you know, when they are minors, they may be, you know, threatened by their assailant. Or, you know, so uh, that's, I, I always say, you know, I'm here, you're not alone. Um, you don't have to disclose anything that you don't feel comfortable sharing with me, or you don't have to go into any details. But, you know, just so you know, I'm here, you're not alone, and I will support you. I will support any choice or decision that you may make. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know we said we're going to go to one. We're going to do just one more, um, mainly because you're also, maybe, do we have time? We'll do one more. If you have to get off with time, we respect that. Um, here are some other ones. We won't do this one. I'm talking about someone who's maybe afraid to go in and be tested for STI, saying, I just don't think I could handle that. Um, someone who's pregnant after rape, what would you do or say next? Uh, but we're going we're gonna to end with this one right here. Um, so I'll go ahead and start that poll. Again, after you read this and have a response, you'll go to pollev.com. You'll put in this six-digit number and then write your response. You have a 16-year-old who comes in unsure of what happened last night. She passed out drunk, and when she woke up, some of her clothing had been removed. The last thing she remembers is making out with a guy. She's worried something might have happened and doesn't know what to do next. How might, what might you say or do? And while you're all um, forming your opinions and doing that, we did have a question come in that's a great question asking, are sexual assault advocates mandated reporters? Um, unfortunately, we don't have the time to address that. It's sort of a not-so-cut-and-dry response, but we really respect that question. We think it's great. We'd like to refer you um, to our legal uh, person here, our staff attorney at WACASA. His name is Ian Henderson, and I'm going to ask... Um, Peter, if he can put Ian Henderson, his name, email, and phone number in the chat. So if anyone has any more questions about sexual assault advocates as mandata mandatory reporters, um, they can contact him with those specifics. <laughs> and I, um, this is Michelle, and I had one other thing. Um, one of the other questions that came in was about um, accessing the ASVAST, the Adolescent Sexual Violence Abuse Screening Tool that um, mm -hmm. we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, mm -hmm. The person correctly pointed out that the link to the document on our website is password protected. Um, and I apologize, I did not think about that, that many of you would not have the passwords. Um, so um, I will provide a copy of that document um, to Rose and the fabulous tech support team here so that they can send that out to the group um, so you have a copy of that. And it looks like we're getting some responses in now. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so we've got one person said that they would explain that there are choices. Um, the next response that we got is um, they would offer her support, ask her what her concerns are, offer preventative services, and testing if she's interested. 
we may get another few choices or a few options coming here in the next minute. Uh, but in the meantime, um, Jay, Alma, um, what thoughts do you have on this? About the about the question, the last yeah. these questions. Okay, so you know, again, I think uh, first of all, I will you know offer my support and explain to the victim that you know um, she maybe doesn't want to go um, to a physician, you know, or she may not want to do the same exam, but it's very 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 important, you know, for her. Uh, well-being and, um, you know, that are risks associated with, you know, pregnancy or, you know, STDs and that, you know, I can offer the information. Again, I can give her examples of, you know, other clients that maybe they experience the same thing and they have a positive experience. Maybe, you know, with, uh, if she goes there, you know, in time, maybe, you know, she can get medication to prevent some of these um, um, STDs or even pregnancy, you know, with the uh, morning after, oh my god, I cannot think of the um, the pill. The emergency contraception. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And I think in a family planning clinic we would definitely offer Plan B contraception. Um, mm -hmm. We could talk about STD testing and pregnancy testing for um, down the road. But, you know, it is, you can't give consent if you are passed out, and so this fall under the category of mandatory reporting if this is a minor, and it is. So um, I would do the referral and also for um, to a SANE center. Um, I guess I wouldn't want our nurse practitioners to do exams because you know, in our clinic, unless they're sane trained, because you wouldn't want to destroy any evidence if something did occur. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your participation, Alma and Jay. Thank you so much for giving feedback on that stuff too. It's it's really great to see um, all the things that you've got up there, and it sounds like. We've got some rock stars in general. Yeah, the <laughs> quality of the responses generally was really great. So you guys are on top of this. Um, we, we've we got some, um, we'll ask for questions or comments, but we do really want to respect your time. So I'm going to let Michelle wrap up with one or two things, and then we'll let you go. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, again, uh, looks like I didn't get a link there in the document, but uh, um, sign up for the June 5th and 6th conference. Again, that email went out. You should have gotten it either last night or this morning. Oh, look at Rose's so sex savvy. Um, and then uh, uh, RFP for the pilot products is out, so please um, watch for those. And then um, I'm sure that there is, as last time, going to be a follow-up email with mm -hmm. the evaluation. Um, so please watch what? for that. You mean the survey on the screen? <gasps> that one? Oh, man, you guys are so with it. Um, yeah, so there's the <laughs> survey. Please let us know what you thought. Uh -huh. All right, and if you do have to go, please, by all means, do that. Um, otherwise, we're just going to throw out one more question that we got in the chat for Alma. And the question is, are Latina clients more reluctant to have the SANE exam or report to law enforcement? I think, I think it used to be the case, you know, uh, I'm going to say probably like, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, Fortunately for me, I have, since I've been working in this county, you know, I've been trying to educate the Hispanic community about sexual assault and related issues. And I think, you know, I mean, culture, I don't think it's a barrier. I think they are more forthcoming with the information now. And, uh, you know, I think that with support and with some education, you know, they are now reporting. We are seeing more Latina Latino clients reporting sexual assault. Awesome. Thank you, Adama. Any other questions? All right. Well, with that being said, sorry we're a few minutes late, but thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you all in June.